Morning, everyone. Hope you're all well. So today um, we're swapping roles. Uh, your machine learning customer service assistant is going to be um, Carl Henrik, and I'll be giving the uh, lecture. Um, and uh, what we're going to talk about today is simulation. So let me just share my screen. That's it. Um, now do shout in the chat, warm your fingers up by just shouting out to Carl Henrik that you can see the, see the share. Um, okay, so uh, the subject of today, as I said, is simulation. And really this goes to the heart of what we're trying to do in this um, uh, lecture course which is um, try and uh, get everyone um, up to speed on the type of things that people are doing in the real world in order to express their understanding of the physical model. So what I wanted to start by doing is just reintroducing these objects that we keep seeing. And what I'm showing you here is a set of samples from a Gaussian process with an exponentiated quadratic covariance function. There's just 20 samples here. But what I want to see you to see these things as, as is a simulation. So in the past, you've been sort of seeing the maths of how we combine these things with data. But we can't always do that maths. But we can always do what I'm about to show you next. So imagine that our process is, instead of writing down a prior and combining that prior with likelihood by multiplication and doing the normalization, that all we're going to do is we're just going to sample very many hypotheses about what the function we're interested in is from our prior distribution. So the prior is representing this area in the model space of all the different functions we believe in. And here we're just saying, give us a thousand of those. What we do next is we say, OK, well, let's look at some data. So here we have three data points. And we can see that a lot of these functions are not going through the data points. Now, the process of Bayesian inference you've seen before associates these data points, the three of them, with a likelihood function and multiplies that by the representation of the prior. But one conceptual way of thinking about that is let's just say we're going to throw away all of the functions that are not compatible with these three data points. So that's what I've done here. And we're left with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you can see like the purple one isn't even quite going through. So compatibility here is, is some sense of nearness where actually I think uh, the way I did the code is I just said, show the 10 functions that go through these data points the closest. So, you know, you can see that purple function on the left is not quite there, but they're mostly there. They're close in some sense. And what I'm really showing you here is a sampling view of Bayesian inference. Okay, so Chuan saying, is there a reason the amplitude of the functions is constrained to some top and bottom boundaries? Um, yes, it is. It's coming from the prior. Yeah, thanks, Carl Henrik. Yeah. So that's coming from the prior, the parameters of the prior. And also, similarly, the length scale is coming from that. So those are my assumptions about the functions I believe in. OK. So what's so special about Gaussian processes? Well, to do this normally, I did this with only three data points, because if I added a fourth, the number of samples I would have to have taken to get functions that were going through those data would have had to have been sort of um, you know, an order of magnitude more, perhaps 10,000 samples, something like that. And then if I had a fifth, I would need 100,000 samples. And actually, sampling these functions is relatively cheap. But if you start doing a million of them, then it gets very expensive. And the beautiful thing about the Gaussian process and the math that Carl Henrik was showing you sort of last Thursday is that we can do that analytically. And that's what I'm showing you here, the result of the maths, where we are looking at the mean function of that posterior. So the posterior is basically the collections of all these samples that go through the points in the way we're describing. And we're also seeing the standard deviations of that posterior. That's the elegance of the Gaussian process. Um, 
unfortunately, many, many types of process we might believe in or sort of models we might believe in do not have that analytic property. And unfortunately, the universe isn't as Gaussian as we might like. But it was once extraordinarily Gaussian. So the image I'm showing you here is it's a corrected for, I think there's some gamma radiation um, normally on this image that's coming from the Milky Way, Milky Way, but this has been corrected for this sort of band you normally get on the Milky Way. And what it's a representation of is the cosmic microwave background. So the cosmic microwave background is this echo of the early universe. And in this case, it's been recorded by the Planck spacecraft, which is a European space agency craft space telescope in effect that is measuring these infrared and microwave um, uh, wavelength radiations. And it's trying to measure the temperature. Now, the temperature, but what we're seeing is this echo of when the universe was a plasma and it cooled and instead of being protons and electrons running around together, it sort of um, uh, cooled into a load of hydrogen atoms and visible light was able to be emitted for the first time and it was emitted from those hydrogen atoms. Um, of course, it's very long wavelength now because the universe is moving so fast away from us. But that is the first image you can have of the universe. And what we're seeing in it is the temperature fluctuations in that image. So the actual temperature here is, uh, I think, hundreds of millions of Kelvin at the moment that this occurs. Um, and the temperature fluctuations we're measuring, I believe, are sort of of the order of uh, sort of 10 to the minus 4 or less Kelvin. So this is very fine measurements. It was a very high temperature, but there were these very minor fluctuations. And the interesting thing about these fluctuations is they're kind of fundamental in forming the universe as we see it today, because it's these areas of higher temperature, I believe, lead to higher density. I'm not an expert on this. I may be getting parts of this or large parts of this wrong, um, where you get galaxy formation. So those fluctuations are critical. Um, and the interesting thing about those fluctuations is that the universe was at that time to a very, very high degree of precision, uh, and certainly according to our standard model of physics, a Gaussian process. So what I'm sort of showing you here is an image of a sample from a Gaussian process. And this is in the notebook, um, so you can recreate this. Um, this is a alternative universe sampled from a Gaussian process. So um, uh, what you've seen, the first thing is the data we have, and this is the data that could come out of a similar covariance function. And as you can see in the notebook, that covariance function has things in it like the density of dark matter, the density of regular matter, and various other things that um, I'm not super familiar with. But the reason why the universe is so Gaussian at this point is because, you know, I guess high temperature movements are dominating. So um, it's very much, well, my, my assumption is, I don't know the details. I presume it's very much in the sort of situation that Maxwell and Boltzmann looked at where we have a sort of more of an ideal gas because the temperature is so high. Okay. Of course, the fortunately, the modern universe isn't quite like that <laughs> because we wouldn't be able to exist if uh, it was so Gaussian. Um, and sometimes I like to think of, of, of it as this, that what's actually going on is that there's now a series of the universe condensed into the matter we observe today. There's a series of physical laws that come into play across different scales. And those physical laws are sort of really nonlinear interactions on this Gaussian process that lead to the universe we see today where matter, so in that, um, Gaussian universe, matter would have been distributed in a very smooth way, but of course now matter has very discrete boundaries, like as we see on the Earth on the left there. So somehow the Earth is a product of, well, simple, I don't know they're simple, but relatively simple physical laws just being applied iteratively to that early universe. And that's where we're getting to the non-Gaussianity. So that leads me to a quote, which comes from Stephen Hawking. If we do discover a theory of everything, it would be the ultimate triumph of human reason, for then we would truly know the mind of God. So Hawking is talking about here, a sort of notion that was really popularized by his 1988 book, A Brief History of Time, um, which is the sort of grand unifying theory, trying to bring everything together into one equation. 
Um, now, such theories are incredibly attractive for the reason he's outlining here, but does it really give you, I mean, it's a great quote for selling books. He did sell 10 million copies of this book, but I think we need to look at this from our perspective. Is it really knowing the mind of God? If we sort of assume that what he's saying is this gives you omniscience, it, it falls a long way short of that, even knowing all the fundamental laws by which these things happen, because we just have to return to his predecessor and look at Gauss's quote again. So we may regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its past and the cause of its future. Okay, fair enough. Um, an intellect which at a certain moment knows all the forces which set in nature in motion. Okay, that's what Hawking's talking about. But now we've got a couple of other things to deal with and that all the positions of all items of which nature is composed. An intellect vast enough to submit these data to analysis, it would embrace in a single formula, blah, blah, blah. We're back to our machine learning equation, data plus model through compute leads to prediction. And what Hawking is saying in the way we've been interpreting this equation in this module is that we know the model. We know exactly the laws of physics that govern everything, but we're still left with an extraordinary job in terms of the compute and the data. And we're back to, um, Laplace's quote around the ignorance that we have when we can't observe the data, but also uh, another idea, which is the ignorance we have when we don't have the compute. Okay, so I want to sort of have a think about that compute in particular. So I've tried to draw a little diagram here that represents the type of hypothesis spaces that um, Carl Henrik was drawing. He could draw them in a more mathematical way because we could write down the maths. So what I'm trying to show is some sort of sets of models. So the outer set is all models we might consider where that's like whatever someone comes up with as the underlying physical laws of the universe. Um, now, I wasn't a computer scientist as an undergraduate, I was a mechanical engineer, so I always have to be careful. You know, this course module is all about me talking about things I don't really know about. So apologies if I'm getting things wrong, but um, the way I understand it is that we can sort of take a subset of all possible models that exist and think of computable models, meaning ones that um, are computable in some finite time, according to some model of computation, such as the Turing machine, right? So some things are undecidable, in the universe, um, and there might be models of the universe that are undecidable, I, I don't know. Um, I also think that you can't uh, simulate a quantum computer on a Turing machine. So there's issues around what we can compute today. So that's a subset of all possible models that we might be consider considering. And then a subset of the computable models is mathematically analytic models. So ones where we can actually do the maths. We don't have to resort to the approximations Carl Henrik introduced last week, sampling, uh, variational methods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then finally, within the mathematically analytic models, there's another subset, which is Gaussian processes. So they're not even covering all analytic models. They actually do cover a lot of models that people know about that are analytic, such as Kármán filters or basis function models. They generalize a lot of existing models, but they certainly don't generalize all existing models. So what we basically have introduced so far as a, an analytic approach is just this very, very small subset of all the things we might imagine or want to do when trying to express our understanding of how the universe works. Okay. So, if we sort of map some of these ideas onto um, precise physical laws, then we've got a few different laws that um, we've written down here. And it's worth also pausing to think about what these laws mean. Newton's laws themselves are not an expression of our current understanding of gravity. They're an expression of how gravity operates at the sort of low energy regimes, which we're encountering very often in our daily lives. But uh, 
as we know, relativistic effects do come in for things like um, GPS systems or for navigating from the Earth to the Moon. Um, so Newton's laws themselves are an abstraction. They're a convenience because they're not actually computing the underlying laws that we now believe in. They're saying, well, in this regime, I can approximate almost exactly with this abstraction. Uh, when it comes to Daniel Bernoulli and the work he did on the kinetic theory of gases that I think was so important in informing physics 120 years ago around particle models, and then also giving them the tools they needed to deal with quantum theory. But Huygens was one of the first people to talk about principles like conservation of energy. I also find conservation of energy uh, fascinating um, because conservation of energy is somehow like an observed um, principle that applies across laws. And it's, it's nice because it's like a summary thing that you can apply. A lot of these conservation laws are like this and do some quick calculations um, without, um, you know, or conservation of mass, which is turns out to be equivalent, of course, without actually expressing the details of the laws. So there we're getting clues that we can sometimes say things about systems without um, uh, directly iterating through these laws. Um, Daniel Bernoulli in the kinetic theory of gases, and then later, of course, um, Maxwell's work and Boltzmann and Gibbs's work, that was all about, well, if we look at Newtonian theory and if um, in an ideal gas where we don't get interactions between particles, if we study uh, the sort of uh, elastic collisions that we um, get in that case, then we can show that there's a tendency of those systems to tend towards a Gaussian distribution of momenta. And that's why we can summarize the state of those systems in just a few simple numbers, the temperature, the pressure, and the volume is sufficient. And the temperature is actually giving us the variance of that Gaussian density. The mean is zero. Um, so actually there's another Gaussian process, which is the, um, uh, the independent <laughs> Gaussian process, which is the model of the air effectively in the room, which is highly accurate um, because air is I mean, approximated quite well as an ideal gas. Um, of course, there's no correlations there. So you won't see the patterns we saw in the echo of the early universe. Um, then there are setups like climate simulation, modern climate simulation, where we um, are interested in uh, running the Navier-Stokes equations. We also use them for weather. So the current UK weather model computes Navier-Stokes equations um, on a discrete grid at um, about one kilometer squares uh, within the UK. I think as you go outside the UK, it goes to 25 kilometer, but it basically does these computations across the world. And the same machine and the same code base actually does our climate modeling, um, moving out to larger scales when you're doing those climate models. Um, now, all of these things I'm talking about, I think we can fit onto this single scale. So I really, really like the fact that that first image I showed you is taken by the Planck telescope because there, now I'm not sure if this is true, so again, in the audience might know, do type it in if you do know. Um, I looked up and apparently the observable universe is about 10 to the 27 meters. So that's my right axis here. Now, so I've put the 10, the 27 on the bottom. So there's a sort of log 10 scale here. Um, that's the whole cosmos. Um, and I suspect we must be the, you know, the, the, when, when I think about it, the odd thing about the cosmic microwave background is presumably it emerged from everywhere where everything is at all times, but there's cosmic microwave background that's reaching us from the edges of the observable universe. And I think that's what we're seeing. So I think when we look at that image, um, we are in effect um, 
looking at the outer reaches of the observable universe. There is an odd question which is answered by uh, the word hyperinflation as to uh, how is it that that light has taken 14 billion years to reach us uh, when the observable universe, well, the size of the universe at the time of um, cosmic microwave background was, was much, much smaller. And that's because space itself expanded at some massive rate. I mean, I, I find this all mind blowing, which is why I talk about it, but I'm certainly not an expert. But then, so that's observable universe is measured by the Planck telescope. But on the left, I'm showing you the Planck length. And again, I'm, I'm not a particle physicist or anything like that, but the Planck length in my mind, the model I have it is it's the smallest discrete value of length that makes any sense in our universe. So 10 to the minus 31, and my understanding is below that, you just can't say anything about what's going on. Even above that, you can see we've got the electron and I put these intervals at um, so two orders of magnitude. So that's two, four, six, eight, 10, 10 and a half, and this is all very approximate. 10 and a half orders magnitude larger than that is the electron. Um, of course, that's even a bit weird statement because that's the electron in terms of how big we think it is, but we can't really measure that. And if you try and measure it, it's moving around and appears to be bigger than the proton. Weird quantum stuff is happening all in that region there. Um, a couple of orders magnitude larger than that, you have the proton itself. Um, and then we've got about six orders of magnitude till you get to this object, which is um, ATPA. So we're going to look at that in a moment. That's a protein molecule that exists in your cells, or also exists in yeast cells, that is a proton pump. So that molecule itself is pumping the thing that is six orders of magnitude smaller than the, uh, on the left, so a million times smaller than the scale of the actual molecule. And then just one order, to, order of magnitude larger than that, you've got this little thing that's causing us an enormous amount of trouble, COVID-19, uh, which is about an order of magnitude smaller than the bacterium, which is about an order of magnitude smaller than the human cell. And we're just getting to around halfway up this scale. So a couple of orders of magnitude bigger than that, we've got brains and one order of magnitude bigger than that roughly, we've got humans, cities, our weather across the country, a supply chain across a nation, the climate of the planet, the solar system, the galaxy. Ooh, is anyone else hearing noise? Jay's picking up some noise. I hope it's not my end. It might be me rubbing the microphone. I'll try and hold, pick that up. Yeah, I think it is, Neil. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jay, for putting that out. Um, so then, me rocking back and forth in excitement with all these scales. Um, and then, so above that, there's the galaxy, and then finally the cosmos. Now, what's fascinating about all these is things are just happening at these different length scales. So um, when you look at the Gaussian process, it has a length scale parameter, and and very often when we are abstracting things, we're abstracting away the operations at the lower length scales. So if we think about the hydrogen atom, which is gonna come somewhere between, I thought I, I meant to put it on there, but somehow I've lost it, um, between ATPase and the proton, be probably halfway between them roughly, um, that hydrogen atom uh, is, you know, or water molecules are the things that um, triggered Brownian motion. Um, and Brownian motion, of course, is happening when you observe the particles in Brownian motion. It is not pollens you observe. Uh, that it, Pollen does not move under the influence of water bouncing into it. It's way too large. It's small particles um, that Brown observed within a void within the pollen. Um, those particles themselves, and, and just to give you a sense, um, uh, the, the difference in scale here would be something like um, the throwing a tennis ball at um, the largest North Sea oil platform, which is the largest thing we've ever built as humans. Uh, that's like the scale. And yes, if you throw the tennis ball fast enough, the oil platform moves a little bit and you're magnifying that movement under a microscope and that's what you're seeing in Brownian motion. Um, so when Einstein did those equations, effectively he's abstracting away the fact that there's Newtonian collisions going on there and summarizing the result, which is what gives us 
um, the Vena process, which is the sort of fundamental process underlying Gaussian processes. Now, that's not always going to be enough to describe the system. I mean, some of these things like the cell and the brain are doing much more complicated things. And what I want to look at is some examples of that and sort of how we deal them. So typically we're trying to abstract away these smaller scales, like in statistical mechanics, which is basically what I'm talking about when I mention Boltzmann and uh, Maxwell in that case. And what we end up doing is dealing with those finer length scales by introducing uncertainties. So, you know, the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution is this pure Gaussian distribution. The challenge we're faced with, that's kind of like physics of 120 years ago. If it were that simple today to deal with these low scale effects, to abstract them away into nice, convenient, tractable distributions like the, the Gaussian, then, then we wouldn't be here talking about this. We would have just done that. We're just left with all these things where the low scale effects are, are a little bit more complicated than um, the ones that uh, Maxwell brilliantly dealt with sort of 160 years ago. So these sort of fine scale local laws, what can happen is they lead to these sort of emergent properties. Um, and many of these properties manifest at large scales. So in particular, when there are complex interactions between molecules. So in the notes, all the notes should be online. You'll see that this is a very recent paper from a group at the Stanford Linear Accelerator. Um, but what it is, is uh, a rendition of the VATPase enzyme that we just mentioned that I said is probably a couple of orders of magnitude larger than hydrogen. When you look at this image, what you're seeing is um, the structure of the protein. So I think the, again, uh, it's an area I've sort of worked peripherally in, but what you're visualizing is these alpha helixes, which is one type of secondary structure you get in proteins. So those are the sort of spinny bits. And then I think that where you don't see a helix and you see a sort of tube, that's probably a beta sheet, which is um, a slightly different secondary structure. There's a lot of work done on predicting what the secondary structures will be. But in this case, what they've done is they've used um, a cryogenically frozen sample and they've imaged it with a micro electron microscope. And then they're sort of filling in between the images uh, with molecular dynamic simulations to give a sense of what's going on in, in this uh, molecule. Now, I think I'm more familiar with ATP synthase, which um, I think is, looks broadly like this, but runs in the opposite way. So the, the rotor spins and then it produces ATP at the top. You see those little chunky things moving in and out. I'm guessing here that the opposite, something like the opposite happens. I haven't fully understood the paper, but there's a link to the blog post on the paper. But the thing at the bottom turns out to be a proton pump that is operating a little bit like a water wheel, one of those water wheels that lifts water up. And it, it's used in cells to maintain the concentration of protons, to basically maintain um, a, a sort of organelle in an acidic state, um, which can be important for the chemical reactions in that organelle. I mean, I just find it kind of amazing to look at it. This is when you think about your cells are just filled with these micro machines. So just going back to our, um, our um, plot here, this you can see where ATP is, is on here underneath bacterium and stuff, right? So I'll just put the mouse on it. And it's pro pumping these protons, which are, you know, these sort of six or seven orders of magnitude smaller. So, you're spanning a few, I mean, like when you look at that, what does that mean? It's kind of, a, it's equivalent to um, the size of the solar system and the galaxy, or not quite equivalent to the size of our galaxy in the observable universe. Okay, so that, the molecular dynamics here, um, they're probably taking into account if you were to do the simulations, I don't know, but one would suspect that everything's dominated by the sort of these uh, alpha helixes and beta sheets in terms of the structures, certainly the structures that form. I don't know about the motion. Um, you can see how they're sort of forming the structures there. But what about the bonds themselves? So this is a paper from Deep Mind recently, and actually there's a couple of people on this paper I know, so it's a bit juddy, the simulation, apologies, but this is a many electron simulation of the Schrodinger equation. 
So uh, Alex Matthews, uh, who's on that paper, um, uh, used to be a PhD student in engineering, and is do it, but he's got a physics background and is in um, before he did his PhD, and is in DeepMind now uh, working on these things where they're trying to simulate, in this case, the Schrödinger equation for many electrons, because that's what forms the bonds, the chemical bonds in these. Um, images we're looking at here. So you're sort of going down to another level, right? Now we're actually caring about the proton and the electron itself and trying to understand how and when that bond's going to form, uh, what the circumstances of that bond forming are. I mean, and you can imagine, you know, why is this useful? I don't know, but the sort of thing that is interesting is when um, there are certain conditions under which uh, these materials become, I think Austin Lammercraft told me once it should be the right term would be metallic in terms of these electrons just form a field across the entire um, set of protons and you get very high conductivity. And then you're interested in things like that potentially for superconductors, I suppose. And I mean, who knows, all sorts of stuff. Now, if you look in the notes, you'll see that we've got people in the department that are also walking on the, working on these things. So there's the Accelerate program, which is uh, something that, um, Carl Henrik and, and I are, are both actively involved in mind leading it for the department, um, which is at the interface of um, science and machine learning. And indeed, launching this module was with it in mind that we were going to have this program. Um, and this is going to provide lots of interesting opportunities to work on projects and data like this um, for perhaps your MPhil project or your part three project if you're a part three student. So we're hosting this new program and there's these four department career acceleration fellows. They've listed MPhil projects on the site. Um, they've got a really wonderful diverse range of interests. Um, Challenger is interested in string theory. So he's down at those fundamental laws of the universe. Um, uh, and then we've got uh, Sarah Morgan, who's um, looking at sort of uh, brain networks and how they um, lead to potential psychosis and manifest in various things like speech. And uh, we have uh, Bianca, and Bianca is um, a computational biologist. So she's interested in like modeling of these biological systems and development, uh, which uses all these types of uh, physical model. And then I wanted to mention Bing Ching because she's very closely associated with the last image we saw. She works on um, uh, that type of uh, I guess it's computational chemistry, but it's sort of lots of physics in it. And on her website, if you go to it, which is linked from uh, the, the notes, as are the MPhil projects of uh, the DCAF fellows, she has this quote from Dirac, which I think is really nice to put in the context of Laplace. I heard, first heard this quote from Bing Ching. The fundamental laws necessary for the mathematical treatment of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are thus completely known, and the difficulty lies only in the fact that application of these laws leads to equations that are too complex to be solved. Approximate practical methods of applying quantum mechanics should be developed, which can lead to explanation of the main features of the complex atomic systems without too much computation. That is very much the spirit of what we're talking about here, that you've got physical laws that are too complex to compute, and we're trying to find approximate practical methods. And that's what we're really surfacing with you today. We've given you the background, but this is kind of this lecture with the crux of the philosophy of what we're trying to do. So just to mention the, those, those four fellows is Bing Ching Cheng, as I said, computational chemistry, Bianca Dimitrescu, who's got an applied math background, but doing a lot in computational biology, Challenger Mishra, who, um, sort of theoretical physics background, string theory, things like that. And Sarah Morgan, who does again have a physics um, PhD, but uh, is working in sort of psychosis and brain imaging and brain networks. Okay, so the main approach that we're looking at in this module, and I'm gonna mention some other approaches we could have looked at, um, which are also important, is surrogate models and emulators. And the key idea in surrogate modeling and emulating is that we identify a part of those underlying physics that we can approximate in exactly the way that Paul Dirac said. Okay, 
So try and illustrate why that, you know, I'll give a sort of proof of example, why that can happen. Um, I want to sort of just briefly overview this example of uh, an invented set of laws of physics we can think of. So this is a simulated world, which is John Horton Conway's game of life. Conway unfortunately died, I think in April this year of um, COVID-19. Um, but he was a Cambridge undergraduate and PhD student. And then I think he spent his career um, after that at Princeton. And he developed this cellular automata known as life, which has very simple rules. So it's played on uh, a grid of black and white pixels. And uh, at discrete turns in time, I'm sure many of you have heard of it, but just to sort of mention what happens, you've got these very simple rules apply. So the three rules are that any pixel, that if you look at their neighborhood and the neighborhood is the great group of eight pixels that surrounds them, has two or three other pixels in that neighborhood, it survives to the next turn. And the turns are like, I was gonna say board games, sort of like um, Monopoly, but they're not quite like Monopoly. The turns are sort of simultaneous, right? So you don't like apply the turn to one pixel and then apply it to another. You apply everything simultaneously. Death, any pixel surrounded by four or more pixels dies from overpopulation. Well, that, you know, it just dies. It's not really overpopulation, but that's what we can think of it as. Uh, likewise, every pixel next to one or no pixels dies from isolation. So if you've got four pixels uh, that are filled in your neighborhood, you die. Or if you've got one or two pixels in your neighborhood, you also die. And then birth. Any square adjacent to exactly three pixels gives birth to a new pixel. Now, these are super simple rules. Um, but the remarkable thing about them is what they lead to in practice. So this is something called a glider. And I think it was discovered in um, 1969. So these, I can't remember when the rules were written down. So it was discovered early on by a collaborator of Conway's who was also a Cambridge undergraduate but ended up in Calgary called, uh, I can't remember his first name. His surname was Guy. Um, and the interesting thing about it is it's, well, there's these patterns that form oscillators. Um, and there's, well, there's these two main classes of patterns that form of interest, oscillators and spaceships. So oscillators are patterns that follow these rules and just pulse through a sequence with a particular period across the turns, but stay in the same place. And spaceships do that, but they translate as they oscillate through. So if you watch the pattern, um, you see the grid is moving behind it, but the pattern is basically going through a period of oscillation and moving down to the right. And this glider is sort of famous because it's the smallest number of um, pixels that does such a move with only five pixels. Fun thing about it is once you start identifying these emergent phenomena, you can start working on them. So um, some years after the glider was invented, someone worked out this pattern here. Okay, so when you think about the game of life, I should have emphasized this. What happens is entirely controlled by your initial condition. But of course, any of these states could be initial condition. But if I put random pixels down, that determines what happens. So the number of possible things that can happen is, is, is basically the size of two to the number of pixels in this image. Um, now, what someone's created here is a glider gun. So it's called the Gosper glider gun. And I think it's one of the first known examples of something that expands infinitely. So it's got these two things that I think are called queen bees that run into each other. And then every 30 cycles, they produce a little glider that fires off to the side. Um, so what you can see is we start with these very simple rules, but we're getting these emergent behaviors that are pretty complex and require us to start naming things like oscillators and uh, the gliders are an example of an oscillator that we call the spaceship, the one that's moving, and it's moving diagonally in this case. And I don't know, I think that these are queen bees. Um, moving to this spaceship that's called the Loafer. This spaceship was only discovered in 2013. So people, have, you know, this, there's a big like uh, fan scene around the, this thing of just trying to discover new patterns and what they do and identify them. There's a whole wiki for it. 
But the fact that you can have like shapes that still seem relatively simple, that people, I mean, maybe someone created one but never noticed it, but has only been discovered in 2013 by a guy called Josh Ball and it's moved sideways and it's called a loafer because it sort of moves slowly. But even more bizarrely, you can start putting all of these things together Okay, and you should recognize some gliders in this image and some glider guns that are creating gliders. But this thing here, I believe that's in the middle is a memory. And as we go out, what you should start seeing is on the right, you've got a bunch of spaceships that are moving within a square. You'll eventually see that that square on the right is a pixel. And on the left, the black is a pixel. And what someone did, this is called the octa-megapixel they have implemented the game of life in life. So in other words, they've designed the layout of these pixels in such a way that each pixel is being generated by a game of life that is sitting underneath it. So there's a crazy infinite recursion thing going on. So this megapixel that we see here is itself, it's 2048 pixels. And all this functionality on the left is using a combination of these guns and gliders and the way they behave to basically implement logic. And the logic is of a form that it can take all the spaceships in this pixel. And at some point, as we'll see in a moment, of course, it's very highly speed, sped up, create new spaceships and count the number of pixels, implement those simple rules. Kind of mind blowing. Um, I, I sort of saw about that from this, this very recent video from a guy called Alan Zaccone. I've I put links in um, to this video where he, he also shows um, examples of people who've built Turing machines using these very simple ideas. I think that's a wonderful, um, it's a cellular automata with very simple rules, but it's a sort of wonderful example of how that doesn't tell you anything. It's telling us that basically you you don't know you know nothing John Snow whatever or you know nothing Stephen Hawking whatever the equivalent um, phrases for physics until you start doing the compute and the discovery and that type of knowledge and understanding is the sort of thing we want to capture with um, our uh, emulation so if we can capture for example the notion of the of glider being produced by the way this also applies. Um, a friend of mine who works at the Met Office was explaining one of the things he has to write code for are hurricane detectors, not for hurricanes in the real world, for hurricanes in the simulation. Because the simulation doesn't go, I'm going to create a hurricane when it's creating weather. It just follows Navier-Stokes equations. There's a friend of mine called Neil Robinson who does this type of work in the Met Office. So he has to do data science on the simulation to just find the damn hurricanes, even though we know they exist. So in general, a lot of simulations we use because of everything we're saying do not necessarily implement the very, very low level physics. So there's this notion of the fidelity of the simulation. And you know, I've put extensive examples in the notes here, but just to sort of uh, briefly touch on them. Uh, in Formula One, um, you have simulations of races where you don't simulate the underlying physics, but you simulate simple things like the probability of overtake given the differential top speed between two cars. In the aerodynamic simulations, you simulate the cars in a very different way. You use computational fluid dynamics. So you are actually using physics. So you end up with these different levels and qualities of simulation. Um, epidemiology. So here's a model of herd immunity that also is in the notes. This is a differential equation model that um, is a particular variant of the SEIR model, the susceptibility infection, but there's two compartments for infection and um, uh, the uh, exposed, so um, infected and, ex uh, I got that the wrong way around. Yeah, infected and exposed, you know, that's the right way around. This is the, the a sort of set of six differential equations that implement that. And in the notes, hopefully you'll be able to recreate some plots that simulate uh, different interventions. This is a blog post that was early before we did the first UK lockdown, um, when people were trying to argue for lockdown, trying to show what the effects of an early lockdown were or could be. We don't just have these discrete event simulations like the game of life, but there's also other things we're interested in, just like back testing code. So one of the things that we were interested in when we were at Amazon is um, uh, the so-called buying system. 
Um, and again, this will be in the notes, but the buying system is a massive automated system for making purchases based on what it thinks the demand is at any given time. Um, and when something goes wrong, you basically run the whole buying system in simulation. You, you substitute the real world inputs and you put in simulated inputs. That's another type of simulation. And that's so slow to run. And one of the things we did in that case was um, replace parts of it with um, uh, emulations. Okay, so I'm gonna skip over that. I didn't actually mean to include that. So apologies for that. I thought that was, oh, now my slides have crashed a bit. Um, okay. So um, again, in the notes. Oh, now I've I've, I've freaked it out. Now, sorry. Uh, in the notes, and um, the other thing that you'll um, uh, that's related are related approaches to doing this, right? So we're talking about emulation. There are other ways you can start introducing machine learning to these physical systems. And there's a bit of an overview in the notes of these. These include things like probabilistic programming. So this is where you program in such a way that you can do the approximate inference directly on the program. It's a great idea, but it's actually slow and hard to do in practice. And it would mean that everyone had to rewrite all their simulations in your probabilistic program. Approximate Bayesian computation. Approximate Bayesian computation is basically the trick we pulled with the Gaussian process at the beginning. You simulate from your model, and then you see how close your simulations are to the data, and you throw away simulations that aren't close to your data. And another thing that is super important, we'll touch on, I think, briefly, causal inference. So the interacting with such systems so that you can make inferences about what's causing what, um, which is a sort of a really important area. But we're not going to talk too much about these three different areas, but just wanted to make sure that you're aware of them. Um, so there are some, uh, I provided some links. This is um, friend and colleague and fellow cyclist, uh, Rich Wilkinson, who um, was one of the originators of the ABC idea in his PhD here in Cambridge in the stats lab, and then was a colleague of mine in Sheffield where he was a professor and he's currently professor in Nottingham. Um, and this is him giving a tutorial on ABC at NeurIPS 2013. Uh, this is Elias Barenboim and Judea Pearl giving a tutorial on causality at the same conference. The reason I'm picking that conference because I was tutorials chair, so I was the one that invited them. So you can see I've thought that these two areas were important for about seven years at least. Um, and the thing that we're going to end up doing is emulation. Um, and we're going to learn more about that tomorrow when we start looking at how you use emulators to perform optimization in such complex systems. Um, but there's also introduction to emulation and what they are on the notes. Um, and since we're at 5.2, I'll stop there and we'll see um, if there's any sort of questions that people want to ask now about today's material. You can stop the recording, Elon.